Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, May the 23rd. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this possible every two weeks. Uh, our first guest is Jack Peake, and we're going to be talking about um, trains. <laughs> so, Jack, there's a lot of things you want to talk about outside of Victoria, but mm -hmm. I'd like to just talk about running trains from Langford to downtown Victoria. We've got the track, it sits there. We don't have the bridge now uh, into downtown, but maybe that could be rebuilt as well, I don't know. What would it cost to get something like that going? Okay, let's talk about that particular segment of the corridor. Langford, Victoria, you can put everything that you need into the trackage. You can upgrade all the rails, ties, ballast, the whole works, and put some equipment on the rails for about $25 million. Now, I know you're missing the bridge across there, but initially, the train stops just uh, on the other side of the bridge. Most people work within walking distance. If you want to talk about uh, people being in good shape, a little walk. But the BC Transit, no problem. And Ken Marius, who owns the property where the roundhouse is, is quite prepared to put a site there, uh, build something that would allow the buses to come in there and you could transfer easily from a train to a bus if that's how you wanted to get somewhere further than just locally downtown. But it's very simple. Uh, it's not hard to do. All your bridges are in good shape. A good chunk of the corridor is in good shape. And the Capital Regional District has already spent multi-millions of dollars upgrading all the crossings. So a lot of the work has already been done, and it could be done in about a six-month period of time. Uh, you can move 1,200 people in an hour from Langford all the way downtown. By and large, when you look at the traffic, you'll see that that's mostly one person in a car. So you're talking 1,200 cars. You can get off the road in the course of an hour. So if you run your system all day, you're going to move a lot of people and get a lot of cars off the road. It's, it's not a big deal. It's one of the simplest portions of the corridor to get up and running again, and for a reasonable cost. Okay, so there we have it, folks. I mean, it's sitting there in front of us, and yet we, we exist within a system that is so unwilling to even discuss our real needs, which is why can't we have trains between Langford and downtown? It is right there. You said $25 million to get it up and going? Yep. It was no accident, I don't think, that the city of Victoria took out the bridge because the plan is not to have rail. So the blue bridge into downtown is gone, which is a huge loss to the city. But still, for $25 million, which is nothing, these people spend that much on waste, and here we could have this right in our city. And you're absolutely right. And if you look at a comparison cost, the Malahat is costing, it says right on the board, $34 million. You can rest assured that's probably going to be closer to $44 million by the time they get done. The Mackenzie Interchange was indicated to cost $60 million. It's looking like $80 million now. And the issue of the bridge across the, uh, the water there, uh, we lobbied them to leave the old bridge in place or at least the rail segment so that it could be used in the future. But at the end of the day, it's no big deal to put a rail bridge beside the new bridge and access downtown. Not to mention the fact that uh, there's a number of studies out there that talks about eventually putting some rail services from downtown out to the peninsula, to the airport and to the ferries. You want connectivity between what comes in from the western communities and what would go down to that peninsula. And so there's so much logic to all of this at a cost that's reasonable. Everywhere else, the lower mainland is getting all kinds of money thrown at it by the provincial government. The money we're talking about on this corridor is no big deal out of the whole scheme of things. John Horgan says it makes no business sense. Well, he hasn't done the research because I think the business sense is there. The cost for each rider would be somewhere between 5 and $10. And there is not a public transportation system in the world that isn't subsidized by some level of government. Especially cars. Especially cars. I mean, the number cars are, one subsidy number one. goes to cars. And, and when you think about it, right now we have all the best reasons in the world to get that rail service going. We want to save the environment, right? So get cars off the road. Um, we want, we've got the price of gas going through the roof and people really, the cost of operating your car is now becoming unbearable. And so why not put some services in place? I'm sure they are so happy in <laughs> corporate land. Is well, all they're this. loving it. Oh, oh, oh. What's always blown they're me away. They think they're going to get trains? Yeah. Never. <laughs> well, what's always blown me away, I used to go down into the U.S. for, for my winter vacations and you always had competition on the uh, gas stations. One corner could be this price and that corner could be that price and this corner could be this price. The, uh, in Canada, what we have is a monopoly where nobody has any competition in the gas business. That's ridiculous. Why not gas tax money being used to support the rail? 
there's a whole pile of money being picked off the, the driver and, and for his gasoline. So there's a source of funds to put into the rail services. So folks, it's there. It's there. Running trains between almost downtown and Langford, just the removal of stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhere, a couple of places along the, the, the line between Langford and, and almost downtown, we could have express buses going out to the university Absolutely. or to wherever. And really, really... A few years ago, uh, one of the developers out in the Langford area, West Hills, had planned their community around the train. And they were going to build a station. They were going to provide buses running through the subdivision, taking people to the train so they could come downtown. So this has been thought of in the past, and it's still available to us if we sit down. There's at least three developers that I know of that are prepared, besides Ken Marish, to be involved both financially and practically. OK, we've got to do something. There's other things you wanted to talk about. So you're a member of the e &N Railway Roundtable. Can you say a little bit about that? It's a very simple organization. We are a group of individuals that if you put all of our rail experience together, it would add up to about 150 years. We have people right from the top end management of rail, the big rail companies like CPR, all the way down to operating individuals who literally used to drive the, the dayliners on Vancouver Island. So we have buckets of experience. We have uh, a fellow who lobbies in, in um, Ottawa uh, I have a fellow, Brendan Reed, who is a consultant for rail companies on how to build them and, and how to run them. Uh, we've got all kinds of people that are part of this group that we can bring to the table. And that's what we shared with Claire Trevina the other day, uh, the Minister of Transportation. We've got a pile of expertise that you ought to be putting to use. One more point that I really think is important on all of this. We're talking about rail transportation, but Vancouver Island is in need of a transportation authority that would have an umbrella ability to coordinate all of the various transportation systems so that I could get on the train in Duncan and I could come to Victoria and catch something else that would take me to the airport so I could leave my car at home. And those kinds of connectivities, uh, there's options to put a station at the Nanaimo airport and, and people could travel to that airport from Nanaimo or from Duncan if that's the way they wanted to go and stop filling up the parking lot full of cars parked for three weeks. The options and the opportunities are so many and so very. Tourist trains, we got them here. Uh, we could have them here, half a dozen different ones running in different yeah. places. Port Alberni subdivision is a ripe for a, a tourist train coming off the cruise ships. I'm on the board of the BC Forest Discovery Center in Duncan. We had a busload of folks, 51 folks off a cruise ship came to our tourist center. Imagine if you could have put them on the train. Uh, we're looking at train possibilities for tourists between Duncan and Shemanus, between Nanaimo and Shemanus, between off the cruise ships coming into Victoria, you got a great run up to Duncan and see the totems and do all kinds of other things and then come back to Victoria. The opportunities are only limited by people's imagination. And we need to be inviting various operators to put forward proposals so that we have a variety of income for the rail services. The more you get out of tourist trains and freight trains, which is another option that's there, then you don't have to subsidize your passenger services quite as much. You could reduce that and reduce that depending on other sources of revenue. It's, it's a no-brainer when it comes right down to this is the time. It's important to do this now and get on with it. And with the price of gas and the issues over our environment, we shouldn't be hesitating. It should be a simple, yes, let's do it. Well, I'm going to bypass the next few questions. Sure. I'm going to say, why isn't this happening? There isn't a will. There is a will. I mean, people Well, there's want a will from, from you and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's not a will up at the top level. We have people sitting in, in elected officials in various positions in this province and in this country. And the, as far as their vision goes is to the next election. They can look out and they can say, oh, three years from now, I'm, I'm going to be running for office again, and I better make sure that I put some things on the table that I can help get me elected. This particular project to restore the rail services on Vancouver Island requires vision. And I'm not talking about five or 10 years. I'm talking about 10, 20, 30, 50 years. If you think about how far you could go, Campbell River is, is ripe for the extension of the line and the former uh, logging line that's uh, out there that they shut down this year at the WAS, that's one of the best kept rail lines there is. So you connect Campbell River to that and now so you're, you're talking about a vision. A vision. But there is a vision. And the vision is exactly what we have all around us, folks, because that's the vision that makes the most money for the people who run the country. The car companies, the oil companies, they don't want trains. 
trains make sense for us, right? So that's what we're, and they own the media, and they seem to own all the politicians too, <laughs> including the NDP, and being a member of the party, maybe I can say that. So that's what we're up against, and I don't know how we can fight through it. Well, it's, it's a strange Canadian enigma, if I might say, because if you look at the rest of the world, everywhere else in the world, and I've traveled to Japan, and I've traveled to Europe, and I've been all over the States and many other places, and the train services that are available there, not just in the heavily populated area. I was in Portugal for two winters for a month, and they have a system that is absolutely a duplicate of what could happen here. The equipment, and it serves all the little communities up and down that lower part of Portugal. And it's an ideal scenario. And all over the states now, you've got the same thing happening. But even go back to Ottawa. There's a, an old freight line that runs right near the parliament. And they've restored that, and they now have passenger services on that. And it's the same kind of a system that we could have here. Down in Dallas, Texas, they're still running bud cars that they started on a service down in that area and they've been doing it now for 20 years they're re reusing the old style bud cars or rdc units or whatever you want to call them that we had here so there's so many examples out there of what's possible and what is being done that we in canada lack the vision in the political arena to do what should be done what we needs don't to lack be done. the vision it's the wrong vision wrong it vision everything yeah. we i i think people want I mean, years ago, uh, Bill McDonald did lots of surveys of people back in 1994 when there was a chance to build light rail or mm -hmm. some system out to the Western communities. Yeah. And there was tremendous public support. Yeah. And if you look at some of the information that's out there right now, there's our report on, on the actual cost to fix the, the rail line. Uh, over here, I have a, uh, an item that was from before John Horgan got elected, and he talked about how much he was supporting the railway. That's his verbatim quote. Back east, you they had mean, an eight. You mean John has changed his mind. Yes, he mind. must have. <laughs> Back, 18% uh, more passengers traveled on Via Rail's inner city trains over the Easter long weekend. So there's people wanting to ride trains because they're tired of it. And I just want to quickly run through a few facts from the Island Corridor Foundation, who've done their background and got some work. And I got it from them yesterday. Uh, first of all, there are no cost estimates for this issue of converting that corridor into a bus lane paving it, whatever, and the biggest problem is you couldn't do it with the existing railway bridges that are in place. That wouldn't allow it to happen. Um, the VIA people and all the rest of it already have an agreement with the ICF uh, to get things up and running the minute the corridor is repaired, and it's that money to do the upgrades and repairs to the corridor. The tourist business is huge. Um, communities along the Capital Regional District have already spent that big sum of money that I told you about. Uh, crossing gates and, and lights and all the, the best up-to-date equipment. Some of those... All the best up-to-date equipment, no trains. No trains. <laughs> but they did it because the railway was there and they wanted to put a trail here, so they had to do it. Some of those crossings cost them a million dollars for one to upgrade. Um, so you, if you use the three RDC commuter trains with, with a passing siding, that's the capacity for your 1,200 passengers. It's, it's not rocket science, yeah. it's simplicity. Uh, the infrastructure money, the pro uh, federal government is turning it out in bucket loads. And the money we're talking about here, the 25 million for down here, or the 43 for the Nanaimo Langford, that's nothing out of the billions that they're turfing out exactly. the back door to you all kinds of. You wanted to talk about the press releases. This, yes. Yeah. yeah. We've only got less than. Okay. The press release. Uh, if I could just uh, steal it from you here, um, we had one uh, rally here back on April the 13th at the Langford train station. Uh, Stu Young was there. Barb Desjardins was there. Some others were there. It resulted in our meeting with the. Uh, Minister. So right now we have a new one scheduled and we really want a lot of people to be there Friday, June the 1st, 2018, 11 o'clock at the Duncan train station. We've already got some folks lined up to come and speak, the Mayor of Duncan, uh, First Nations representatives and others. Uh, so we need everybody to be there and, and we're going to do this rally again and we're going to keep doing it up and down the island. This, this isn't going away. Like I told people, the day they lay me in the grave will be the day I stop fighting for this rail system. So and we're out of time, so we're going to end it right there. But Jack, <laughs> thank you very, very much. Uh, folks, this is a big fight. It's all the right things lined up against all the wrong things. And uh, we should really try to make it happen. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. And uh, today we have with us uh, Dermot Travis. Dermot is with Integrity BC. And Dermot's always... Uh, 
looking at the numbers, looking at the government's doing and seeing how the numbers add up and if it actually <laughs> relates to reality. So uh, guess what? We look like we got another, uh, would be a scandal if anybody ever would find out about it. <laughs> But it seems like it's one of these things that there's so many happening that we don't know which one to pay attention to. And that is the building of a pi uh, no, pipeline, excuse me. <laughs> That's the whole problem. It's a transmission <laughs> line now uh, <laughs> that BC Hydro sort of got in trouble with. So thanks for coming in, Dermot. Maybe you could just give us a scenario of what's happened here with this, uh, how this pipeline went or how this <laughs> transmission line went. Well, well I was going to say that if, I, if Site C were a person, I'd be very lonely right now because it's the pipeline that's getting all the attention. Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> that's actually providing, I think, PC Hydro a bit of an opportunity to deal with some of their dirty laundry. Yeah. And some of their dirty laundry came out a couple of weeks ago. Now, what was interesting is most of us knew this was coming. We just didn't know what the dollar sign was going to be attached to it. And it goes back to 2009. Okay. And one of the favorite slogans of the former government, and I hope this current government never uses it, and the slogan is, on time and on budget. Everything comes in on time and on budget. They just simply change the f completion <laughs> date and change the budget to make it fit. Well, back in 2009, they proposed a new transmission line uh, from the interior to the lower mainland. No question, something that needed to be done. From merit or? Yeah. yeah. And the estimate was $602 million, which, quite frankly, I don't think I... I've seen anybody dispute as being an unreasonable estimate. Yeah. That estimate kind of disappeared. Yeah. And at about March, April 2014, and the transmission line was supposed to be finished by then, uh, they noticed they'd run into a few problems mm -hmm. during the construction phase of it. Uh, some of it included issues related to archaeological uh, preservation, uh, First Nation dialogue that had not taken place, that suddenly threw the contractor into a loop because it was BC Hydro's responsibility, not theirs. And some of the towers, transmission lines rest on towers, uh, were brought in from India and didn't have the capacity to hold the weight of the towers, uh, hold the weight of the lines, which meant they collapsed, which oh meant gosh. they needed to get new transmission towers which meant it wasn't going to be finished in 2014. Uh, and the energy minister at the time, Bill Bennett, uh, categorized the whole situation as a failure of the contractor to perform. Okay. Now, let's move forward, because we're still at 602 million, right. with an understanding it's going to go up a bit. Fast forward 2015, project's finished. November 2015, big announcement, new CEO, President Jessica McDonald, very proud, finished the line, brought it in, only $18 million over budget, which isn't bad, but she yeah. changed the budget. <laughs> it went from $602 million to $725 million. All right. Okay? okay. Uh, it also meant, and she said, that due to some scheduling pressures, not inability to perform, but scheduling pressures, yeah. uh, the contractor had to get assistance from their own hydro crews to build one of the most critical parts of the line over Spasm. Everybody's happy except there's this little note in the financial statements of BC Hydro that there are some bills that are in dispute between the contractor, Flatiron Graham, Flatiron being one company, Graham uh, right. b being another, and they formed a joint venture to do the line. And it's only in the past month that we've learned how much extra BC Hydro has to pay for those bills that were in dispute. And okay. we're looking at probably an additional $100 million. So right. we've gone from $602 million <clears throat> to yeah. $843 million for this yeah. line. That's about 40% over budget. Yeah. But what I find interesting about this, and it's very British Columbian, like yeah. it, it really I think it's probably one of the few provinces that does this. Flatiron worked on the Portman Bridge, was one of the contractors there, which we've talked about before, went yeah. over budget. Lower mainland transmission line, not only did it go over budget, we had problems with the transmission towers. Uh, we had a $100 million dispute that has to be paid out now to Flatiron. They turned around, they being BC Hydro, yeah. because they don't hold a grudge. They're nice folk at BC Hydro. They turned around and gave them another contract <laughs> oh, to work on Site C. 
Oh. <laughs> and, and, and what's, you know, I think really interesting about this is that the contract, as with most major contracts on projects, are usually consortiums, various companies brought yeah. together. They bid on the contract. And with Flatiron, uh, you have another company called Dragados. Yeah. And you have another company out of Montreal called EMC Inc. And you have another company out of Ontario uh, called ACON. And breaking news, just prior to coming down here, uh, the federal government has rejected uh, the deal of the government of China with right. one of its companies to buy ACON. Yeah. So now we're going to have another little wrinkle <clears throat> in the whole situation with Site C and that contract. Here's what's funny. Flatiron? It's working on another project right now in Montreal, and it's running into scheduling pressures oh, I again. See. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> now, $275 million from the federal government last month helped clean up those scheduling pressures. Oh, right. Uh, who else is working on that contract over in Montreal? EMC Inc. Okay. And, oh, can't forget Drugatos. It's a small world, isn't it? Yeah. Now, <laughs> you see, What's interesting about it is you hear all of these corporate names and what you forget is that they're actually all subsidiaries of a parent company. Right. Okay. So, Trigados is owned by a Spanish company called ACS Grupo. Okay. Okay. Flatiron is owned by a German company called Hochtief. Who is the controlling shareholder in Hochtief? ACS Grupo. Oh my gosh. Now, we bring ACS Grupo back into Canada again, they're running into scheduling, well, they ran into scheduling pressures yeah. in Ontario yeah. uh, with Herb Gray Parkway Express. Yeah. And they had to pay $100,000 a day to the government of Ontario because they failed to meet their deadline. Yeah. They got the contract because they bid $200 million less than what the government had expected it to cost. And lo and behold, who's doing the same thing up north? BC Hydro. Yeah. The contract that it first awarded on Site C to Asiona, Petro West, and Samsung was the lowest of the four bids. It is now no longer the lowest of the four bids. It is higher than the second lowest, yeah. and there are $320 million in bills in dispute. So there you go. And then you have the Northwest transmission line. I don't think. <laughs> and yeah. Now I, you ha, you're remarkable that you remember all the names. I mean, but the Northwest transmission line was that the line that was being built up to a large mine or something. Yep. yep. Now what's the, just briefly give us a little history of that. Uh, well, that's another project that went over budget, and it was a project that went over budget for two reasons. One, because the government didn't exactly disclose what the entire project was about. Oh. Um, the Northwest Transmission Line it was intended to be able to provide power to mining companies working up in that whole northwest section of yeah. British Columbia. And a whole number of mining companies, who happened, strangely enough, coincidentally, to be major donors to the BC Liberal Party, um, <laughs> were, were pressuring the government to build this <laughs> transmission line. <laughs> and lo and behold, we get a transmission line to nowhere, quite frankly. Yeah. I believe there's only one mine open up there, uh, the Red Chris mine, yeah. uh, which is owned uh, by Imperial Metals, okay. which owns Mount Polly. And right. um, Red Chris couldn't wait for the time it was going to take BC Hydro to go from its transmission line yeah. to its mine. Yeah. And so it built its own transmission line, and then BC Hydro bought it off them. On the same corridor, more yep. or less. So, and then they bought it. I imagine they got a good deal on that. Uh, Imperial Metals got a good deal <laughs> on that. Um, but, you know, the mine, uh, sorry, the transmission line had been intended to take a lot of the small First Nation communities off of diesel generators, provide yeah. them power. It hasn't accomplished that because transmission yeah. lines come with very high voltage, uh, if you want to bring it into somebody's home, you can't bring it in at the same voltage. That's right. Otherwise, the home ain't going to be there. <laughs> and they haven't been able to fix that uh, or address that. They know how, but there's going to be prohibitive cost-wise to do yeah. it. Uh, so the only happy customer up there is Murray Edwards, and he's living in London, the United Kingdom right now. Well, that seems interesting in that 
given the disaster that had happened at Mount Pauli and the Imperial Mines for the company, it seems that their penalty was they got to open another mine somewhere else and they got a really good deal from the provincial government for the power line that's required. So, oh, And they also got $17 million of debt owed to the government from another mine forgiven. Oh. But they did that quietly in a cabinet meeting. Yeah, that's just, uh, you know, pocket change in what we're talking about. Especially when you're thinking about, uh, say, for instance, Jack was talking about the rail corridor and we could have rail line here pop possibly for $25 million. All of a sudden you start to realize that some of these numbers are really quite big. Oh, yeah. And I think you know, if you look at Site C, in 2010, when it was first announced by Gordon Campbell in a dress rehearsal, it was $6.6 .6 billion. Those are the days. 2014, beginning of the year, $7.9 billion. By the end of the year, $8.8 .8 billion. Yeah. With KPMG saying exemplary process, wonderful estimates, love it. Good stuff. <laughs> Signing on the dotted line. This is this is the price, yeah. and we're now at ten point seven billion dollars. That's so remarkable, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, you know, one would wonder. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a little bit cynical about this. And, yeah. uh, is that uh, just how well, like, say, for instance, the executives of BC Hydro are really how well they're doing the bidding for us taxpayers. Know, how, how much scrutiny is really going into this? Uh, are these really mistakes or are they just con sort of convenient oversights that uh, you know, we know the taxpayer is going to pick up the tab? I think one of the things that the public has to look at is how many companies bid on a contract and who wins the contract. And you'll see with government bids that sometimes they'll tell you how many companies bid. Yeah. They, they have to have it forced out of them how much yeah. they bid, but they will give it to you. Um, and sometimes they don't. But yeah. what you will see is that a very small group of companies keep winning all the contracts worth more than $50 million in this province. Yeah. And a whole group of companies that should be bidding are not bidding. And that smells in most jurisdictions. Now, why are mm -hmm. those companies not even pricing it or not just getting the work? They're just not even getting involved. Because they're th they've decided BC is a closed shop. We're not getting involved. Not worth the time and trouble. That and, and some companies, and we saw it before the last election. They said it anonymously uh, to the media, but we don't pay to play. That is so remarkable when you think of it. Uh, you know, we're spending time looking at the, the you know the major projects in BC, and, and you start hearing the names over and over again, the different companies over and again. And uh, if you look at in the government, you'll hear the same names over and over again of deputy ministers that go from one government to the next government. And the old policy seems to continue on quite seamlessly. And the new minister sort of has to catch up. They might have made a few campaign promises, but when they're elected, oh, the reality sets in. They, and all oh, that isn't the way it's going to go. And overnight, uh, their minds are changed. And we just seem to just can't continue on and on. And I, this is one of the reasons why we're advocating for uh, some type of proportional representation in British Columbia, to try to change that <coughs> dynamic, you know. I think one of the things, and there are a number of people who've called for this, and from all levels of society, BC needs a public inquiry into the procurement processes and the relationships between those companies and the Liberal Party of BC. Excellent. And it should be modeled on the Charbonneau Commission. Yeah. In Quebec. Something is rotten. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has talked about it from the Times colonists to the New York Times. Yeah. We all know there's yeah. something rotten. Uh, the only way we're going to find out exactly what and how to fix it is to have a public inquiry where you can subpoena witnesses and documents. Excellent suggestion, Dermot, and I hope we uh, can get to that here in British Columbia. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It's always a great, great education talking to you, and it's a really, it's really refreshing because when you start to hear the facts and you start to hear what's really happening, it it helps us understand where what's really happening here. And we're not necessarily getting that from our daily uh, dose of uh, corporate media. So uh, that wraps up this segment, and uh, stay tuned for the next segment.
Well, welcome to this segment of Citizen Citizens Forum. My name is Rick Habgood, and I'll be hosting this segment. Today we have Fernando Gressi Grespo. I hope I pronounced that right, Fernando. Good enough, good enough. Good enough, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that you, one, one of the things that goes along with your name is Climate Reality Mentor. Yes. What does that mean? What is that? So, um, in, there's an organization called the Climate Reality Project, uh, chaired by um, Al Gore, the former Vice President of the United States. So uh, after losing the 2000 election, he should have won, but that's another subject, um, he started exploring the subject of climate change he was always passionate about. And uh, one year he organized a training to train people to present the message behind the, the movie An Inconvenient Truth and his uh, general climate message to others. And he held it in his barn in uh, Tennessee, uh. well, close to Tennessee. And uh, then it just kept growing and uh, it kept growing and growing and growing. And now we're 14,500 uh, leaders. Wow. So I'm a, I'm a leader as well as a mentor. So I was trained to be a leader and to give speeches on climate change in 2016 in Houston. And then was a, served as a mentor in 2017 in Seattle. And now I'm the chair of the local hub, which is like a chapter of the, of the Climate Reality Project in Victoria. I think it's especially important right now that uh, we engage locally with things like the Climate Reality Project hub, is seeing the leadership that Burnaby has had in environmental issues and, and, and oil infrastructure and the strong position Al Gore has taken against the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's more important than ever that we act locally but think globally and, and be able to learn from other places and from other countries and from bigger leaders than ourselves. Well, isn't that wonderful? You must know Brian Gordon. Yes. Yes. And he and he's is he in the same boat? He's a mentor also. He's a leader. He's a leader. Uh, right. He is uh, working in our hub. Uh, I believe. Uh, I think. I believe he's uh, our uh, our co our co chair for policy. Right. So uh, I'm the chair of the of the hub as a whole, and then he's the chair of uh, our our policy committee. Wow. Well, at your age, uh, this is the elephant in the room. And you can't put the elephant back in the closet. It's too no. big. Okay, let's get on with uh, now. Of <laughs> so we're going to be discussing uh, voting systems, and we're going to be discussing first past the post versus proportional representation, and what it does to a society. Is there some indicators that you can mention that you've been to Europe? recently yes you've been to 19 countries 19 countries you actually went to actually 19 countries in that short a period of time yes my goodness uh, yeah so um tell me you you've been to england actually you know maybe we should talk about the question period yes. at westminster so uh when I went to Westminster, I was uh, wanting to visit it, and there was this big like visitor center, and everyone was like around it. But I realized that people didn't actually want to see the the discussion because when I went to the, to the to the Westminster to the hall uh, where where the House of Commons is, it was particularly like half half empty, and I was very disappointed to see the engagement that people from all over the world that go to London and Londoners didn't go and see and see that. So. Uh, Sadly, of course, uh, Theresa May wasn't there because it was not a prime minister question period because only UK residents are allowed in, in those and when the, when the prime minister is answering in question period. But uh, Vince Cable, leader of the Liberal Democrats, was there and the, and minister, and the minister of, um, of Health was there. And it was very interesting to see how divided, uh, how divided them. Yeah, the, the house was. You could more or less tell which position one side was going to have over the other. And there was, and the, sadly, even though it's first past the post, I did see a little bit more uh, of a, of a, of a educated and kind act than what we see in the House of Commons and, and, and here in Canada and in the Legislative Assembly. I did see, when I've been to the Legislative Assembly, it's a much more hostile culture than, than what I saw in the House of Commons. Uh, but still, the, the, the culture of opposition was clear from the way the, the, the place is built. When I went to the European Parliament and saw it, I didn't go to question period there, or the Bundes, uh, 
or the Bundesrat in, uh, in Germany, they were always constructed in a circular manner. Because that means that you're not me against you, but it's me with you. You know, you sit next to the people from other parties, regardless if you're in government or opposition. And you may have that your person who's your coalition partner is in one side and the other, and even in, 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 in it is divided ideologically, but it's divided in, in like a spectrum from right to left. And, and you truly see that collaboration where, where, where here you, you, you don't. Yeah. And when Westminster, you don't. So it was from the architecture and from the way things are built, I found it very interesting visiting 19 countries, the difference in how things are built and particularly parliamentary houses and the chambers. It was very, very interesting. Mm. Well, the uh, Westminster system, where you have the House of Lords and the House of Commons, uh, that's what it is, it's adversarial, and it's, it's a fight, that's what it is. Yeah. Whereas in the Bundestag, I've been to the Bundestag also, and absolutely, you know, you see that circle of, of different parties, and they're all working together. Yes. So there's no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind, that that translates a message to the outer society. Exactly. So maybe you could talk about that. So, uh, yes, the idea that, you know, I can talk to someone and, and, and have different political views in them and uh, see that families and, uh, and groups of people are not as divided as, uh, as, as, as they are here or even more so in the United States. Uh, today in the morning I was reading an article uh, from Gina McCarthy, who was an EPA administrator before Prout. Uh, she was in the Obama period and she said how people working in the EPA couldn't return for their homes for Christmas because their families wouldn't accept them because they were Republicans. And uh, even though that's to an extreme, the system is prone for that. And we're seeing that even more and more and more in BC, where we're seeing rural areas become more and more and more liberal and urban areas become more and more and more NDP. And the thing that happens is that polarizes things. Because me, as let's say, as a person living in, in, in Saanich, I see as the interior, and I, and I don't have a close contact with the interior, and what I see from the politicians is always much more right-wing. When there are some progressive voices trapped there, and when someone from the interior says, sees the urban area or Vancouver Island, they just think we're people who want to tax everything away from them, and we're just progressive and hippies and, and tree huggers, <laughs> when in reality, there's some pretty conservatives in the bunch. So this idea of, of, of strong division between one side and the other is not seen there. Why? Because because you don't need to win the plurality in the district, you just need to win everywhere. So all the politicians give, maybe not an equal, but a decent share of their time and their effort and dignity to every single voter and to every single town. Because you know that one vote there and one vote in the other place will count the same, whereas here it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't count at all. Sometimes it doesn't count at all. Exactly. So uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on, uh, when I was in Europe, uh, I too visited many different cities and one of the things I noticed was that was the absence of homelessness it was the absence of people on the street asking for money uh, I didn't see anyone in a doorway sleeping in a doorway in Berlin I didn't see it in Amsterdam I didn't see it in Copenhagen I didn't see it in Vienna Budapest yet you can go downtown Victoria and in one block, see almost four or five people, you know. Yeah. So maybe we should talk just briefly about what it is about a voting system that produces different results within the society. I think it's a culture of collaboration. You know, it's, it's, it's this idea to quote the... Uh, Jagmeet Singh, or to paraphrase, he said that we need to have the love uh, to realize we're all in this together and, and have the, the courage to demand stronger. And, and that is this idea that, that they know that they're in it together, even the conservatives, and even if they, they know they're in the same society and they know their vote is going to count the same as the people who are poor because there's such a strong public engagement that there's, there's, there's here in, 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 in Canada, I have worked on, on many campaigns, and sometimes it's like, not because people are mean, but just because they know they're not going to go vote. We don't go and knock on the doors of people that are humble. And because they don't have a voice, they cannot represent their interests. And because their interests are not represented, then we get policies that go against them. Because their votes generally don't count. And because those people want bold action to be taken. And parties that go against the establishment or who are generally new and progressive ideas, 
generally don't get the plurality of votes in a district, but nonetheless, they deserve to be heard. So this lack of representation for those people who are in the cracks of society leads for them to go even deeper and for the division to be even, even, even bigger. The same way between our generations, my generation's interests and, uh, and, and baby boomers' interests. Like, because we don't vote and we are disengaged, I would say one of the big reasons the voting system, our interests are, our interests are not being heard. And because our interests are not being heard, we dislike the government. And by disliking the government, we're less likely to go out and vote because we say even if we vote, it won't change anything because we stop seeing the difference between one party and the other. So this idea just creates an anti-government feeling that can turn very quickly into an anti-democratic feeling in which we're seeing record uh, numbers of youth not believing in democracy. And then that is a huge problem. And, and it, really, it really comes to the point where how do we innovate our voting system? How do we innovate to a system that is, that is more progressive? First pass, the post was created decades, uh, not decades, centuries ago. And it was created because if I voted in this electoral district and my candidate won, then they went and represented me. And I wouldn't hear who the prime minister was until later because how would we count the votes for the nation as a whole? It was impossible. But why are we keeping a system that was invented before the United States became a country, that was invented in, in, in the 1600s. Like, it's, it's just ridiculous. I agree. I agree. And, and what we need to do is to move on. We need to upgrade the system to a proportional system. It's going to, be, it's going to take time to turn the ship around. There's no doubt about that. You know, so it's a lot of, thing, a lot of people under the influence that if we do, do win the referendum that's coming up, there is going to be a referendum, a BC referendum. And um, we want everyone to vote yes in that referendum because we need change. If we get change, it will take time. It'll probably take a generation before we really see. Yeah. But you're going to be, for your age, we and, and people that are young such as you, that's why we're fighting. We're, we're really fighting a battle so that you and your children and climate change is dealt with because climate change is not being dealt with. Not at all. Not at all. No. And that is directly, I think, due to the voting system. Exactly. And the thing is that if there's no party to hold the balance, if no, there's no party to hold others accountable, the main concern of the big party is to win a re-election. And that's always a main concern. But if we have another party that is in the middle controlling the imbalance in power, they will need their collaboration to be able to win the next election. So there's more of, of, a, of a better policy rather than the policy that is more popular because they know they need to convince a leader of another party. And that leader of another party may not be as easy to convince as the general public with this uh, corporate control media and with this, this idea that they throw out there. So it's, it's really about needing to putting them and work together. If there's two kids that don't get along in, uh, in elementary school, you put them work together. That's what we do. At least that's, that's how I grew up. You know, you don't just divide and you don't say, okay, you don't like uh, Johnny, you don't like uh, B Bob. You sh we split you up on one side and the other and a sword's laying away from each other so you cannot throw each other scissors. Like that's the way our, 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 our parliament is made. It's, it's a sword's length. It's yeah. made for, for anger, for... Ad for uh, yeah, the ignorance and for and I for and for opposition and it's 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 terrible. It's a street fight. Yeah. Survival of the fittest. Exactly. Fernando, Gracie, Grespo, I really appreciate you being on. It's been wonderful. Our time's up. Of course. But thank you so much. It's my and pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much, everybody, for listening to this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. I'm Walt McGinnis, and uh, this segment of the show is uh, what we, Jack and I like to call the Walt and Jack uh, segment, and in which we try to piece together what is the meaning of it all. What what is it all? What how is it all happening? We read the paper, we kind of read the facts as they're presented, but it's very hard to figure out what's really happening and who's pulling the strings. So we'd like to pull up uh, a few stories and uh, hash out what we think is going on. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Walt. So I'll let you uh, lead off here. What have you brought in with you? Well, I just scrawled it all down in the last few minutes, but 
the, the Kinder Morgan story. What we're seeing is the power and the ability of the corporate media and the corporate politicians, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but what we're seeing is, I mean, we know better than to trust the media and we know better than to trust the politicians, but when they come together and tell us a story, we all believe it. And the story is that there's this fight between British Columbia and Alberta mm -hmm. over you know, the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And it's all about jobs and prosperity in Alberta. But I think the whole story is a pack of lies. It's all been put together by, and again, maybe I'm wrong, but the real story is we face absolute catastrophic disaster. Our lives and our children's lives for sure are in danger because of climate change. It's coming at us like a runaway rhinoceros. And we're going along like, like Trudeau tells us we have to build more pipelines as the transition into the future. It's insane. But they've created this story. Now, the Kinder Morgan pipeline, from a business perspective, if you go a little deeper than what's told to us by our cor cor corrupt corporate media, there is no business case for it. There are no markets. The unions oppose Kinder Morgan because it's taking away jobs. So the whole story we're being told, yeah. and yet we all live within that story and it controls us. Yeah, you know, and as we try to piece this stuff together, what I've been doing is trying to look at the players and who, where they're all from. And like we talked about uh, Mr. Kinder and Kinder Morgan, he was the ex-president and CEO of Enron. And anybody who cares to go back and look over the Enron scam, it was the largest uh, collapse of a corporation at the time in the United States. And it was basically a Ponzi scheme. So you, you have uh, Mr. Kinder, and who brought along with him uh, several of the, the top uh, uh, officials in his company into, the, into his new company and left behind Kinder Morgan, or left behind uh, Enron, which five years later imploded and uh, uh, mums and pops all across North America lost their life savings and everybody else made a lot of money, including a lot of Canadian banks. Yes. So, but there are a lot of connections here. The same people are, are doing it to us over and over again. And that's what's most troubling is we're not allowed to learn our lessons. We're not allowed to say, no, we've had a little bit of that. We know that doesn't work for us. So, and we have the same players again and again trying to do the bidding. And in this case, it's our local politicians and our provincial politicians. Yeah. So. I don't know how we can get out of it, you know? I mean, that is exactly, the, they control us. The corporations control this country from top, unfortunately, to bottom. Um, I don't know how they do it, but they do do it. They own the media, and it, it's like the, their tentacles are everywhere, and it's destroying us as a society. Well, you know, Dermot Travis had a good suggestion of having a, a commission in, in, in this province that looks at all these activities and how this money has been spent and proposed projects and make certain demands that, that have to be met. Uh, and uh, when you have a company like BC Hydro, who has, a, that's running BC Hydro is Accenture, I took over the administration of BC Hydro, but it just happens to be an organization that spun off of Enron. the Enron scandal. They were the, they were the bookkeepers and the accountants that invented a lot of the tricky bookkeeping that they brought along with them. And now uh, BC Hydro is using those same bookkeeping strategies. Should we be surprised? Well, wait till the NDP gets elected. They'll fix this stuff. Well, up. the thing is, is if you had a, a really powerful public uh, commission that wasn't attached politically, we might have a chance to get have more scrutiny on these guys. The politicians have too much power. And the politicians work for the 1% of the 1%. The politicians' job is to control us, even down to the city level, our own city councils, who we know. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. They, they work for the Uber Lord, and they control us on, on behalf of, of these people. That's why proportional representation is important because it does, it, 
it gives people more of a, it gives us the governments we vote for. I mean, is that yeah. too much to ask? It gives us the governments we vote for. It doesn't give the party that gets 40% of the votes the power. It gives the parties that together get more than 50% of the votes. It gives them the power. Yeah. It changes fundamentally in many respects the way government operates and it gives us more power. That's why they're going to fight so hard to make sure we never get it. And I'm talking about the corporations that run this country. Well, it seems like a... a and their media, which the, which the attack on PR is non-stop now. Yeah, I think it's a war of silence right now. Uh, the, the NDP are not uh, bringing forward what the referendum question is going to be. They don't appear to have any campaign arrangement. They may have something that we don't know anything about. But we should be having an ongoing discussion through the media, daily and weekly, just going through the different aspects of different electoral systems, looking at the pros and the cons, just educating the public in a way that's fair and, and allows people to form uh, uh, informed uh, opinions. Uh, but we're not getting any of that. And, and I think we're just going to come at us. Uh, the summertime's going to roll around. Everybody's going to be out at the camp and they're not going to be want to talk, think about politics. Then the fall's going to arrive and there's going to be a whirlwind campaign. And uh, anything can happen in, in a very short period of time. Um, there, we have been told, I think, that by the end of May, uh, the ballot will be released by the end of May. So That's this very is being close, filmed Jack. on the 23rd. So hopefully the ballot will be out basically when people are watching this show and we can see yeah. what we're going to be voting on. Uh, the ballot is very, very important. I really hope we have a fair and honest and democratic ballot, which in my opinion is the kind of ballot that was used in Prince Edward Island about a year and a half or two years ago. Um, and what they did was they gave people five choices and you could rank them one to five. The current system, uh, a modification of the current system, and three PR systems. And a form of PR called mixed member proportional, which is the kind I like, won in that referendum. Uh, if, so I hope we have that kind of ballot because it lets everybody pick their well, choices. Well, the referendum itself has to be democratic, has to be fair. I remember the Liberals set the bar at 60% when the first referendum, and we got 57 to 58%. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be a wildly successful majority government in any measurement. None of those parties ever have gotten 57 or 58%. That's right. That's right. So, uh, Why did 57% lose to 43%? because that's how powerfully they don't want PR to get in. They will do anything to stop it. And it's in the media, it's never ending, from what I hear, 90 to 10 against PR. And they're just getting ramped up. So yeah. it's gonna be a fight. We're fighting for something very important because PR is important, it's more democratic. Is that too much to ask? Yes, it is. Yeah. And everything we talk about, all the issues, fall under that. Because if you have democratic government, it won't let this kind of nonsense that is being done to us go yeah. on. Because we don't want it. But they want it because they're just stealing all the money. So much for PR. So what else do you have with it? Well, where do you want to go? Um, oh, here. For the crime of trying to protect the planet, the people of British Columbia are being threatened by the oil industry of Alberta and their puppet, Rachel Notley. We're being insulted by all the media. Mm -hmm. Our own guy here on CFAX, uh, corporate journalist Adam Sterling, um, his position is that Alberta is giving and giving and giving in the oil industry. And no matter how much they give, we will not, we, we who want to protect the planet, we will not be appeased, yeah. right? That's the message we hear throughout the media. And our leader, the guy who has been put in the position of being the leader of our side, John Horgan, doesn't say a word. I mean, he's got a million different arguments he could make about Kinder Morgan, and he won't say any of them. So yeah. the whole thing, the whole thing. Well, I, I, when they're in the system, they are afraid to fundamentally challenge the structure of the system. Like, uh, and I think 
um, we're almost asking too much from people that have been elected under this system because their interests have never really been for the people. That that it's uh, they have their own interests, and one of which is their own career. And uh, and uh, I think they have their connections with uh, with all those lobbyists. All those years can't be forgotten. And I just think. Uh, we can't look for them as for leaders in this in this area. We have to create a new a new and fairer system. And, and as Rick Hapgood pointed out, it'll be a generation before we really evolve into a culture and a society in which there's more fairness. And and the, that adversarial system, you know, just falls away. And people are collaborating and trying to figure out what's the best way to go. And I think that's going to take time. But it's, now it's time to start and to set this up and then allow it to happen. I agree. And just, just to give people an idea of what is going on, um, th this, I got an email from somebody I know just, just by email up in, up in the Peace River, yeah. and, but around Fort St. John's where they're doing the, the fracking right now. Um, and it's big, it's big up there. Um, Residents of Farmington, which is, which is in that area, in particular that I've spoken to, experience banging and quakes, earthquakes, every day. For myself, I usually hear what sounds like the roar of a heavy truck, and then the shaking begins. These are the people who live around there. This is what is being done to them, in complete secrecy, because the media yeah. won't talk about it, and the NDP government of John Horgan still approves it. A while ago, there was a particularly loud roar followed by a very strong shaking. I happened to be standing by my kitchen cupboard, and behind me was my big antique oak table, which I dived under just as the cupboard doors flew open and several dishes flew out and smashed on the floor. Fortunately, nothing hit me. We are also subject to, every, to foul smells most of the time, which cause many kinds of physical problems for most people, including myself. Having been gassed by hydrogen sulfide years ago, I am now chemically sensitive, sensitized as are numerous people I'm in contact with. There is also the spike in sinus infection, vertigo, asthma, headaches, loss of taste and smell, chemical pneumonia, cancer, etc. Our rate of cancer here is unheard of. I guess the government needs the money and forget the residents, we are expendable. That's northeastern British Columbia in 2018. Yeah, and a lot of that stuff is borne out in real statistics, too. This is not just an opinion. Uh, uh, some uh, First Nations people, like downriver from the uh, tar sands on the Athabasca River, uh, their cancer rate is just off the charts. So there's people really, really suffering, and, and uh, they're just not being heard. That's what we have to change, folks. I don't know how we can do it, but it is a mess out there. Yeah. PR is one big step in the right direction. I think so. And, and we all have to participate, educate ourselves. We have to work on this. And uh, that's going to wrap us up for this week. We're getting the signal. So uh, thank you for so much for joining us this week. And uh, uh, thank you for watching Citizens Forum. Yeah.